Hello everyone, I'm Norman Walberger. In today's lecture we're going to look at a very well-known classical problem concerning the binomial theorem and expanding a binomial like a plus b raised to a power. This is perhaps not a very fancy or sophisticated problem, but it's actually probably one of the most important problems in this entire series. Because the binomial theorem itself is such a foundational, fundamental building block for algebra and a lot of other parts of mathematics. Because this is such a fundamental topic, it was studied in various forms by many people. We're going to concentrate today on Omar Khayyam, who was perhaps the first one to really understand how the general binomial theorem goes. All right, so famous math problem number five is to expand a plus b to the n for n a natural number. And this is my preferred notation for a natural number. It's a type rather than an infinite set because I don't believe in infinite sets. And this just expresses that n is an object which has type natural number. We're talking about one, two, three, four, and so on. And I'll roughly assign it a difficulty level d equals four. It probably wouldn't take you a full year to figure this out if you started from scratch. But it really depends very much on the algebraic foundation that you have. This is an interesting part of this historical aspect that the early pioneers didn't have our very concise algebraic notation that makes calculating something like this much simpler. So back in the days of the ancient Greeks, or the Arabs, or the Hindus, or the Chinese, they rather used more words to express problems. And to state the solution to this in words is a lot more cumbersome than our current way of using very compact notation, which we'll get to at the end of the lecture. All right, so the simplest case, other than the trivial case of n equals 1, is when n equals 2, when we're expanding a plus b squared. And all high school students know that that expands as a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And this was first understood by the ancient Greeks and clearly enunciated in Euclid, Book 2, uh, Part 4. So for the ancient Greeks, this was primarily a geometrical result which was encoded by this little picture here. We have a square, and uh, the sides here have uh, subdivisions into L segment A and another segment B. There's an equal segment A and an equal segment B. And we can see that the area of this square, which is A plus B squared, can be divided into the area of this little square, which is A squared, and this square here, which is b squared, and these two rectangular areas which both have area a times b. Now the general case for a general n was solved by Omar Khayyam, a Persian mathematician, lived from 1048 to 1131. Sort of the golden age of Islamic culture in that region. He was a mathematician, he was an astronomer, but he was also a poet and a philosopher. And uh, he lived in a city in current Iraq called Nishapur, which was at that time a rather major center for Islamic culture and studies. So we don't actually know exactly how he solved this problem because his work on the subject has been lost, but we do know from various other sources that he was able to solve the nth problem. In other words, he was able to express or expand a plus b to the nth. And so let me remind you, even though it will be familiar to many of you, how these various expansions go for small n. So here is a plus b to the 1, a plus b squared we've already seen. Here's a plus b cubed, a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed. a plus b to the 4th is a to the 4th plus 4a cubed b plus 6a squared b squared plus 4ab cubed plus b to the 4th. And there's a plus b to the 5th. These computations these days are relatively simple with our algebraic notation and the use of the distributive law. The distributive law, say in this form here, 
is that when you multiply something of the form A plus B with something else of the form C plus D, you have to get four different terms. You have to multiply the A times the C, the A times the D, the B times the C, and the B times the D, and add them all up. If you're multiplying something a little bit more complicated, like A plus B times C plus D plus E, you have to go through the same motions. You have to multiply each of the ones in this term with each of the ones in this term. So altogether, there'll be two times three different products all added up. So A times C plus A times D plus A times E plus B times C plus B times D plus B times E. And of course, we could continue this for larger expansions. So this is the heart of how we calculate one of these things. So for example, once we've got an a plus b to the fourth, say like this, then to get a plus b to the fifth, we're going to multiply all of this by a plus b. So we're going to multiply each one of these terms by a, and also each one of these terms by b. And then combining equal terms, we would get uh, this expansion here. And we should observe that the uh, terms that are involved all have powers of a and b that add up to 5, for example, here. So there's an a to the fifth here, an a to the fourth times b, so the total degree is 5. Here an a cubed b squared, total degree 5, and so on, all the way up to b to the fifth. And the most curious thing is these, uh, these coefficients, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. How do we get those coefficients? How can we write them down compactly? How can we expand, for example, a plus b to the 10 without having to actually do the arithmetic? That's the essence of this binomial theorem problem that Omar Khayyam solved. So Omar Khayyam's work uh, about this is uh, contained in a book called Treatise on the Demonstration of Problems of Algebra written in 1070. He uh, mentioned here that the Indian work uh, of about 500, 600 years earlier, prominently Aryabhata, uh, on, on cubic powers. So the Indian mathematicians knew at least how to expand a plus b cubed. He was actually motivated by a problem of finding cubed roots and finding higher nth powers of a number. That was a, a, a sort of tricky problem that you need to understand the binomial theorem in order to attack that problem. So that was his main motivation. He was also, one must say, a prominent philosopher and poet. And uh, he's only a, one of a handful of mathematicians who excelled in a literary fashion as well as a mathematical one. His most famous work is called the Rubaiyat which was made famous by, in the Western world at least, by a translation of uh, Edward Fitzgerald in the uh, 19th century. And it's a series of quatrains, 101 quatrains on uh, life, love, wine, destiny, and uh, many other things. It's actually quite pleasant to read, and I might uh, give you a bit of selection of that at the end of this lecture. All right, so he was a multifaceted uh, fellow, made contributions in a lot of uh, directions. We're going to see his work in some other famous problems on this list uh, later on. So a few hundred years after Kayam, the Chinese certainly understood the binomial theorem as well. We have a mathematician, Chu Shi Jie, whose uh, work uh, includes this uh, table here, which we now see or think of as the Pascal Triangle. So it actually goes back uh, several hundred years before Pascal to Chinese mathematicians. And it's clear here that this row here, for example, represents the coefficients when you expand a plus b cubed. So the Chinese knew how to expand binomials. In the Western world, the uh, Pascal Triangle appeared first in the work of Michael Stiffel, 1544. He wrote a book called Arithmetica Integra, in which this table appears. And again, we see the binomial coefficients there's not a row of 1's here or here, but we see the 3, 3, and the 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, sort of not continued. But it's pretty clear if you're familiar with the Pascal uh, triangle that it's essentially here. So let's have a look at the modern treatment of this theory. With the benefit of our modern notation, 
with our very concise algebraic tools. So when we expand a plus b to the n, what we're doing is we're multiplying this term a plus b together n times. And when we do that using the distributive law, well, we get a number of terms. And each term we get is obtained by taking one of these two elements, multiplied by one of these two elements, multiplied by one of the next two elements, and so on, all the way up to one of these two elements. So we have to make n choices, one for this bracket, one for this bracket, all the way up to one for this bracket. That means that each term we're getting when we expand this out individually has the form a to the k, b to the l. Some power of a times some power of b, where the total power, k plus l, has to be n, because we have n terms being multiplied all together. So the question is really, what is the coefficient that appears in front of this term in the expansion? Or in other words, how many times do we get this particular term when we expand this all out? Well, the coefficient is then the number of ways of choosing Ka's from the n possible positions. So the number of times this particular term appears corresponds to the number of ways we can choose these n choices with a appearing k times. So the ka's that have to appear here can be from any one of these n positions. And once we know how many ways there are of choosing k from n, then we have that coefficient. So this combinatorial aspect of the binomial theorem was perhaps first uh, appreciated fully by Levi ben Gershon, who was a Jewish scholar who lived in uh, France around uh, 1288 to 1344. He was also an astronomer, and I guess he was maybe the first to realize that the binomial theorem and what we now call combinatorics were intimately connected. These coefficients that appear in these expansions are actually counting something. That's the key point. So for example, suppose we're talking about n equals 5 and k equals 3. In other words, when we expand a plus b to the n, what would be the coefficient of a cubed b squared? Well, this would correspond to the number of ways of choosing three a's from five positions. And there are exactly ten such ways, and here they are. So we can choose the first three a's, or the first, and the second, and the fourth, uh, and so on. You can see that there are exactly those ten ways of picking three a's from the five positions. And it's worthwhile saying that once we've chosen where the a's are, well then the b's are going to be obvious. Right? The b's are just the remaining blank spaces there. So the a's determine uh, everything. And that means that when we expand a plus b to the fifth and look at the coefficient of a cubed b squared, that coefficient is going to be 10, corresponding to these 10 ways of choosing the three a's from the product of five binomials. Of course, we'd like to have not just a combinatorial interpretation of this coefficient, but also an efficient way of computing it. And this formula here for it, so this is the number of ways of choosing Ka's from n positions, or we might also say it's the number of ways of placing Ka's in a row of n positions. It's this number here, and sometimes it's uh, written n with a small k below it. It's n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, so we're multiplying successively smaller, smaller numbers, down to n minus k plus 1, ensuring that there are exactly k terms in this numerator. And we have to divide by k times k minus 1 all the way down to the product 2 times 1. This kind of formula, I think, probably is first due to Pascal. And uh, let's explain where does this formula come from. So we're interested in seeing why this combinatorial number is given by this algebraic expression. And one nice way of seeing that is to consider the a's not as being all interchangeable, but rather ordering them. 
So putting little subscripts on them so that we now have an ordered set of A's rather than an unordered set of A's. So the K A's are now labeled A1, A2, up to AK. And we're going to agree to place A1 first, and then A2, and then all the way up to AK. That's easier to count because the number of ways of placing A1 in these n positions is n. And then once we've placed A1, there are then n minus 1 free spaces left. So there's n minus 1 possible choices to put A2. And then after that, there's n minus 2 places to uh, put A3, and so on, down to n minus k plus 1 places left at that last choice when we're putting in a sub k. So the number of ways of placing these k objects into the n places where we insist on putting a1 first and then a2 and then all the way up to ak is this number here. Alright, so for example, if n is equal to 5 and k is equal to 3, then one possible way of filling the a's into these positions is to put the A1 there, so that you have a choice of 5 for the A1, and then once the A1 is there, well then you have 4 choices and maybe the A2 will be there, and then after that there's 3 choices for the A3, and we happen to put it there. So altogether 5 times 4 times 3 possible ways of uh, putting in these 3 AIs. Now, ultimately, we're not interested in the number of ways of putting in these ordered A's. We're interested in the number of ways of putting in the unordered A's. So we want to rub out the labels. So we want to compensate for the fact that having an A here, an A here, and an A here can be obtained in a number of different ways. We could have put the A1 here, and then the A2 here, or the A3 here. So in other words, we must divide by the number of permutations of the set A1, A2, A3. And that is k times k minus 1 down to 1, which is k factorial. So that's where we're getting this formula for the number of ways of choosing or placing k objects into n places. So I realize that this argument that I've just given you will be familiar to many of you. And this is more evidence of the importance of this problem. The problem is so important that almost all students of mathematics see this at some point. There's a slight reformulation of it that I think is useful that I want to show you. That's when we focus not just on the ways of placing the A's, but include the B's as well. Now that may seem redundant because once we know where the A's go, then the B's are automatic. But you'll see in a minute why that's a useful restatement of things. So the number of ways of placing k a's and n minus k b's. We can think about that by labeling both the a's, so a1 through ak as we had before, and also labeling the remaining b's, b1, b2, up to b, well, l or n minus k, say. The number of b's and the number of k's has to add up to n altogether. So now we have n things. And if we're going to put those n things in these n places, there are n factorial ways of doing that. n for the first one, times n minus 1 for the second, all the way down to 1 for the last one. Now, what we have to do then is we have to divide by the number of ways of rearranging the a's, multiplied by the number of ways of rearranging the b's. So we have to divide by k factorial times n minus k factorial. So for example, uh, in that previous example here, we had the a1, a2, a3, and we made those choices. Then to complete the thing, we could also choose a b1 to go there and a b2 to go there. So all five places are now represented by this factorial all the way from 5 to 1. And then to go from this to the more symmetrical situation where we've rubbed off the indices, we have to divide by the number of ways of rearranging the three a's, which is the three factorial here. And we have to also multiply in the bottom by the number of ways of arranging the 
two b's in this case, which is two factorial. So this is exactly the same number that we got before, it's just a different way of presenting it or thinking about it. So we can think of five choose three is either five times four times three, divided by three times two times one, or we can think of it as five factorial divided by three factorial times two factorial. And here are the general versions of those statements. And Pascal was really the first one to, to write these things out uh, rather explicitly. It's probably worth making a small comment here that there's a little bit of an interesting number theoretical aspect to this in that it implies this argument that the product 5 times 4 times 3 is always divisible by 3 times 2 times 1. So more generally, any product of k consecutive numbers must be divisible by k factorial. Why? Because that ratio is counting the number of ways of choosing k things from n. So it has to be a positive integer. Blaise Pascal was a French prodigy who lived 1623 to 1662, died rather young, but made important contributions to mathematics, to probability, to the binomial theorem, to projective geometry, and was also well known for his literary and philosophical writings. He accomplished very much in a short time. And he wrote down this triangle, which is now generally called Pascal's Triangle, although it certainly was known to Stifel earlier, and certainly was known to the Chinese uh, 300 years before that. And probably the, the Arabs knew about it uh, even before the Chinese. So here is the, uh, this table, or part of it, of course it keeps on going. So we have the numbers 1 along the first row, natural numbers. Here are the triangular numbers, tetrahedral numbers, and uh, various uh, generalizations along the subsequent rows. In terms of these coefficients, which are the n choose k's, they're appearing along these diagonals here. So when we expand a plus b to the fifth, we have to look at these diagonals, and here are the various coefficients. And here is the binomial theorem as it's usually expressed. a plus b to the n is the sum from k equals 0 to n, n choose k, a to the n minus k, b to the k. And an important aspect of these binomial coefficients, these n choose k's, is this recursive formula for them that allows you to calculate uh, n plus 1 choose k plus 1 in terms of two uh, binomial coefficients with a smaller n, n choose k plus 1 and n choose k. So this 15 here is the sum of 5 to the left and 10 above it. This 20 is the sum of 10 and 10. So for example, 6 choose 2 is 5 choose 2 plus 5 choose 1. There is 6 choose 2, that's 15. That's 6 times 5 divided by 2 factorial or 15. And that's equal to 5 choose 2, which is 10, plus 5 choose 1, which is 5. So there's our modern compact way of writing the, the result of Omar Khayyam. It's the binomial theorem, absolutely fundamental building block for algebra and indeed much of modern mathematics. There's an important extension of the binomial theorem, first to trinomials and then to larger expressions as well. So if we have a plus b plus c instead of a plus b, and we square that, then we can write it as a squared plus b squared plus c squared, the so squares of the three individual terms, plus twice the various products of the various terms. So plus 2ab plus 2bc plus 2ac. When we expand a plus b plus c cubed, we get a cubed plus b cubed plus c cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3a squared c plus 3b squared c plus 3ab squared plus 3ac squared plus 3bc squared plus 6abc. And here is the general trinomial theorem that tells you that when you expand a plus b plus c to the n, 
Then you get a sum over all positive integers, k, l, and m, that add up to n. And you, the coefficients are these multinomial coefficients, generalizations of binomial coefficients, which we might call n choose k, l, and m, multiplied by a to the k, b to the l, c to the m. So the terms here are all of degree n. And there's one term for every way of writing n as a sum of three positive integers, positive including zero. And what is this multinomial coefficient in this case? So n choose k l m. Well, that's n factorial divided by k factorial, l factorial, m factorial. And this is easiest seen if you think about this second interpretation of the binomial coefficients that I gave you. That what you should do is you should think of a term like this, asking what's its coefficient. It corresponds to labeling the a's a1 through ak, the b's b1 through bl, and the c's c1 through cm. And then the number of ways of putting those on the uh, on the n places is n factorial. And then if we want to take the labels off, we have to divide by the number of arrangements of the a's, the number of arrangements by the b's, and the number of arrangements of the c's. So it's uh, pretty well exactly the same pattern as with the binomial theorem if you think about it the right way. And of course, the extension to having four terms in here is uh, not much difference once you have written it this way. It's pretty obvious what the multinomial theorem should be. So if you're interested in the binomial theorem and various extensions, one uh, reference is to the Math Foundations 54 and 55 that I wrote down on one of the previous slides but didn't mention it. So these are videos in the Math Foundation series where I talk about binomial coefficients and the binomial theorem and various extensions of it. This binomial theorem has many applications to calculus. In fact, the two most important formulas in calculus, which are these two right here, right? these are the two most important formulas in calculus. The derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1, and the integral of x to the n, say from 0 to a, is a to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. These two formulas are both built on the binomial theorem. So I'm going to explain that in more detail in my Math Foundations uh, lectures when I get around to discussing an algebraic approach to calculus. But it's well known, this is certainly well known, that the derivative of x to the n rests on the binomial theorem. It's less well known that this formula does also. Another interesting application is to the exponential series. I prefer not to say the exponential function because I don't think of it as a function. I think of it as a series, something like an analog of a polynomial or a polynumber, except that it kind of is ongoing. It keeps on going. So this is 1 plus alpha plus alpha squared over 2 factorial plus alpha cubed over 3 factorial and so on. Some kind of analog of a polynomial in alpha. And this particular series has very important multiplicative property that x of a times x of b equals x of a plus b. And you should think of this as being at the level of polynomial arithmetic. If you think of this ongoing polynomial and you multiply it with this ongoing polynomial, then it naturally equals this ongoing polynomial. And there's a souped up version, which is also interesting and less uh, studied, that x a, x b, x c equals similarly x a plus b plus c, which of course is a consequence of this, but it's interesting to think about it independently. So I'll leave it to you as an exercise to show that these two formulas at the level of exponential series, or essentially polynomial arithmetic, really are resting on the binomial and trinomial theorems. It's a very interesting and instructive and important exercise to do. All right, so that's um, Omar Khayyam and the binomial theorem. And I want to end by reading you just a little bit from the Rubaiyat. All right, so here are a few randomly chosen verses from the Rubaiyat, 
which by the way it makes great reading if you have nothing else to do for an hour someday a Sunday afternoon and a glass of wine it's probably a very nice uh, thing to sit down and read and of course you can get it on the internet very easily so the Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam translated by Mr. Fitzgerald 100 years ago wake for the Sun who scattered into flight the stars before him from the field of night drives night along with them from heaven and strikes the Sultan's turret with a shaft of light and as the cock crew those who stood before the tavern shouted open then the door you know how little while we have to stay and once departed may return no more come fill the cup and in the fire of spring your winter garment of repentance fling the bird of time has but a little way to flutter and the bird is on the wing whether at Naishapur or Babylon whether the cup with sweet or bitter run the wine of life keeps oozing drop by drop the leaves of life keep falling one by one that's Omar Khayyam so in our next famous math problem we're going to go back even further in time to the greatest mathematician of all time and probably the greatest thinker in history we're going to go back to Archimedes and his squaring of a parabola this is a foundational calculation which really sets up calculus more than 2,000 years ago so I hope you'll join me for that I'm Norman Wahlberger thanks for listening